to my computer. Johnny, thumbs up if if you could run PowerPoint and everything. You, you have everything that you need up to this point. Yeah, good. Okay. Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, I hope that question about hard things the Lord has asked you to do um, was awesome. We we, we also had a, another conversation before. Um, those of you who came late, we were talking about who is the greatest, right? Like the greatest sports icon, greatest um, person, uh, m musical icon, you know? So we're going to be getting a lot into that this morning, basically, who, who is the greatest. Uh, but before we go there, we got some other, other parts of the passage that we're going to talk about. Um, good morning, River of Life. Wave if you could hear me. All right, awesome. Good morning. So we've been going through Mark's gospel since the beginning of January. And as a reminder, you know, we decided to study uh, the life of Jesus so that all of us would have a good understanding of who he is. And more importantly, so that we could have an opportunity to just fall in love with him, right? Like to have this falling in love with Jesus experience. And as I mentioned a few weeks ago, um, chapter eight of Mark's gospel, uh, Mark's is like a significant transition in our story. Jesus asked his disciples, uh, uh, actually, uh, yeah, he asks his disciples, who, who do people say that I am? And, and the response that they give is that, you know, some people think he's Elijah. Some people think that he's John the Baptist. Some of the people, you know, the, um, the prophets of old. And then he asks them again, yeah, but who do you say that I am? And at that point, Peter responds, uh, you are the Messiah, right? And then the tone of the narrative changes. We've been talking about that. Jesus tells them that the son of man will suffer and be raised again on the third day. So Pastor Jesse continued in that theme last week when he talked about the transfiguration scene on top of the mountain. And if you remember, Jesus is metamorphosized before the very eyes, right? He appears to them with Moses and Elijah, and the Lord says, says this is my son, listen to him. And one of the things that Jesse talked about was the fact that there is no resurrection without the cross. Um, he drew us this really awesome image. I don't know if you all remember. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> awesome image. Uh, and, and he told us, as you know, that he reminded us that, the, you know, God's people are expectant, you know, they're sad, they're waiting for Elijah, and after Elijah comes, the Messiah uh, will come, and Jesus doesn't argue that, right, like the kingdom is going to come, God will save his people, and they will celebrate, and, you know, he's saying, like, people will be happy, um, that's what everyone expects, but after Peter's confession, Jesus tells them, actually, that all those things are going to happen, but that the Messiah actually needs to suffer first. Right, that the deliverance will come, but first he will go to go to the cross. Um, and Jesse reminded us, suffering and death is part of the mission. But before you get to that happy place, those things need to happen. In other words, it's not just Elijah and the Messiah; it's the cross, and then and then we're going to see um, things happen, move forward. Now, I wish we could say again, right? Like I wish we could say that the disciples got it, but as we'll see in this morning's passage, they totally don't get it. So today we're going to be looking at Mark 9, 30 through 41, uh, and we have slides for you, but I'd like to invite you to follow along if you're in your Bibles if you have them. I'm old school like that, FYI, right? Um, if, if you could always have your, your Bibles with you, uh, and, and not your Bible on your phone, you know, so that you're not checking any scores or uh, whatever Sunday morning news shows are happening right now. Uh, I love old school Bibles. So we're going to be looking right now at um, Mark 9, 30 through 32, and I'm going to invite Abraham, actually, to, to read the text for us. For those of you who are my co-hosts, if you could um, help allow people come into the meeting, that would be great. Molly, I need to make you a co-host. Abraham, brother, will you take us away? Of course. Um, verse 30. They went from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. They did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Awesome. So we have this transfiguration story right after Peter's confession, and then the other disciples stay behind, unable to cast a demon out of the boy. That was the previous passage that we saw. And, and now the 12 disciples and Jesus are back together again, and the focus of chapter 9 is not necessarily, again, the ministry of Jesus in the same way that we saw in the first eight chapters. Um, what we're looking at right now is 
Jesus focusing on teaching his disciples. And Mark actually makes that case very clear to us in verses 30 and 31. They were passing through Galilee, uh, and Jesus did not want anybody to know about it for or because he was teaching his disciples. And he tells them again, right? The son of man is to be betrayed into human hands and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. And what I wanted to do is just like a quick uh, comparison between that first confession and this confession. So Mark 8, 31, and then Mark 9, 31. Um, in his first prediction, he tells them that he was gonna suffer many things, right? That he's gonna be rejected by the religious leaders, that he's gonna be killed. And that after three days, he's going to rise. And then the second prediction, he adds one more further detail uh, that I've highlighted there for you. He says that the Son of Man will be betrayed into human hands. Now, that word, word in the Greek is paradidomi, which means uh, to deliver into somebody's hands, right? To give up, to hand over. And by implication, it means like to betray or to surrender or to take somebody to prison. Um, it's not only that Jesus is going to going to uh, die by the hands of the authorities, it's that somebody is actually going to betray him and hand him off, right? And, and, and Mark is beginning to put some of these details together, the pieces of the puzzle together. Now, as readers, we already know that he's going to be handed over and betrayed because Mark has already told us. He told us that back in chapter 3, verse 19, when Jesus chooses the 12, right? Mark names off the first 11 disciples and ends with... Uh, and Judas, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. We know how this ends, but the disciples aren't there yet. Now, again, I think they would have never imagined that the Messiah would have been put to death this way. They don't want to be, they, don't, they just don't, don't want to accept it, even when they hear it, right? They didn't get it the first time when I mentioned it three weeks ago. Um, they're not getting it now. They're still not going to get it. Um, and I, what I want to say is, you know, before, again, like before we cast judgment on these guys, I would like to remind us that we don't always get this cross and suffering peace either, right? If given the choice, we're going to take the easy way out, I believe, nine times out of ten. And, and, this, and if this part of my uh, sermon feels like a repetition of what I said at the end of my sermon three weeks ago, it's because it is. Um, and if the disciples who lived in a society that was more accepting or where, where suffering was more common, if those guys didn't get it, what is the chance that we're going to get it? Right? Choosing into suffering, again, is offensive to us, especially as, as, as Americans. Uh, I'd argue that we treat suffering like it's not a normal part of life. Right? I was reading an article in, uh, in preparation for the sermon about the American inability to deal with suffering. And the author argued that we want to be happy, healthy, and wealthy, but that we're not always willing to suffer and sacrifice for those things. Right? And this is what she says. I believe this wanting is only natural and that wanting to be happy, wealthy, and you know, whatever else. We want to be, um, what is not, okay, so I believe this wanting is only natural. Johnny, I do have a slide for this. What is not is that we want to be wealthy without having to work all that hard or study all that much. We want to be healthy without having to eat well, sleep through the night, or exercise regularly. We want happiness and love and contentment without ever having to suffer or sacrifice and we want it now. So she's getting at the fact that uh, we always want the end goal. We always want the end, the happy end. But I don't think we always want to uh, suffer the cost or, or put down what, what it's going to take to make that thing happen, right? And if we had time, I would have us brainstorm all the different ways that we try to avoid suffering in life. And I think that we would be shocked uh, by the extent that avoiding suffering and choosing into hard things uh, or avoiding, uh, you know, choosing into hard things impacts uh, who we have relationship with, right? What type of career paths uh, we choose into or not choose into, uh, where we choose to live or not to live, right? How we spend our money, how we don't spend our money, and how we spend our free time or how we don't spend our free time. Um, when, when I was uh, coming on staff with university, you know, as a 23-year-old, 20 years ago now, I was looking uh, to grow as a Latino Christian man. You know what I mean? I, uh, I didn't have a lot of mentors who were like that. I wanted to grow as a leader, as a Latino Christian leader, but I didn't know what it was going to cost me, right? And at the time, I, I didn't know a lot of Latino staff in the movement of InterVarsity. Um, we had maybe one or two in Los Angeles, 
So I started looking outside of the movement and I started asking people, uh, hey, do you all know anybody who could mentor me, you know, who's a Latino Christian? Uh, I'm looking for an older male who could, who could like pour into me. And one of the names that kept coming up was this guy uh, named Rudy Carrasco, who was directing an inner city ministry up in Northwest Pasadena called the Harambe Center. And everyone I, I, I would ask, they would always come back with like, you should call Rudy up. So I called Rudy up and I tell him who I am and I tell him that I'm looking for a mentor. And he tells me to come to Pasadena the next day to have lunch with him. So during lunch, you know, I, I start, you know, telling Rudy, yeah, you know, went to UCLA, came to faith there. You know, God is calling me to do my thing uh, here as a college pastor at East Los Angeles College. And bro, I'm just looking for a Latino mentor. You know, I just really want to grow. So he hears me out. And when I'm done talking, he says, Abner, I'll mentor you. And I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, I'm going to grow, you know? And he says, I want you to come to Washington, D.C. with me next week. The National Hispanic Prayer Breakfast is happening. Um, there's going to be Latino Christian leaders from all over the country. This, this is the place where you want to be. The president is going to be uh, one of the main speakers. But you're going to need to raise money to buy yourself a ticket. Uh, you're going to need to find transportation, um, uh, a place to hang out for a week. Um, and, and I'm sitting there like, like, bro, I just met you. You know, I, I just I just met you like 45 minutes ago. And you see, like, I wanted to grow as a leader, but I wasn't planning on, on raising $2,000 in three days and giving my life up for a week for the opportunity to see it happen. But you see, here's the thing, and this, this is why I, I didn't know at the time. Rudy Carrasco had guys like me asking them to mentor all the time, all the time. And what he was doing is he was trying to weed me out. Like he, he, was, he was trying to like to test me. He wanted to see if I was willing to drop everything that I had for a few days, raise money that I didn't have, that I didn't know that I could like raise, you know, $2,000 in three days um, and find the resources in DC uh, to make it happen. I didn't know anybody in DC. I, I, I nev never been there before. Now, why am I spending time on this? Like, why is this important? It's important because there are things that Jesus is going to call us as disciples that will feel like suffering, that will feel impossible, that will feel just like, like ridiculous. Like, Lord, are you, are, you, are you kidding me? And if our American culture teaches us to avoid suffering, right? If nine times out of 10, we're choosing the easy way out, we'll miss out on opportunities for deeper relationship and deeper growth. Right, we're going to miss out um, on, on, on just growing our relationship with people who are hard to love. We're going to miss out um, on spending time with people. We're going to miss out on, on, on hanging out with people who are suffering. We're going to miss out on opportunities for deep growth. And, and there you go, right? Like, I actually made it to Washington, D.C. Man, look, I got hair. I think I'm like 30 pounds lighter. Uh, yo, I walked around the whole mall that day. You know, I saw everything. You know, I must have walked like, um, <laughs> who's that young disciple? Exactly, man. Look at me. I couldn't grow a beard then. Kind of sad. So I, I made it, man. Like, I made it to Washington, D.C. And I landed in Baltimore, which is like 30 to 5, 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, it's a 30, 45 minute train ride to D.C. And I remember standing on the train platform with all my stuff, wondering, what am I doing here? Like, what did I get myself involved in? You know, and, and, and I'll tell you, man, like that trip taught me to take risks. It taught me to follow my mentor's advice, right? It taught me how to act right. Because when I got to the prayer breakfast, Rudy pulled me aside and he says, Abner, this week, I'm going to teach you how to act right around people who are more important than you. And I'm like, oh, bro, you know? Yeah, I'm going to teach you how to not put your foot in your mouth. And I want you to shadow me. And wherever you go, I want you to tell them that you're working with at-risk youth in East LA and that you're with Rudy Carrasco. And man, let me tell you, like I met all kinds of people, you know, and, and he, he tried to weed me out. Um, I went for it. I took that risk and he kept inviting me to other events in LA and I met all kinds of people, man. Like I, I had, I had like, like politicians in the city, you know, who, who were getting my, my prayer letter. I'm pretty sure they didn't read it. But here I was just kind of going around 
meeting all these like Latino leaders. You know, I, I think at one point, Fred, are, are you still here? I met Fernando Venezuela, bro. You know, a uh, uh, famous Dodgers pitcher. I don't, I don't know if you guys know who that is. Really famous. Got a picture with him somewhere. I should have looked for that one. But it was just like, why? Because, because I was willing to take that risk. Now, had he told me that that's what was going to happen, you know, that that's what I needed to go through when people said, hey, call Rudy Carrasco, I probably wouldn't have given that brother a call, you know, because I, I think I would have said, no, nah, I don't want to give up a week of my life. I don't want to raise $3,000. That's crazy. Church. Don't miss out on saying yes when Jesus calls us to do something hard. That's at the core of discipleship, right? Um, to take up our cross. Like, I want us to be the type of church that is full of disciples who are willing to take up their, their process and to enter into hard things when Jesus invites us to. Let's not take the easy way out. Let's be willing to do whatever hard thing Jesus calls, to, calls us to. Amen? All right, for those of you who didn't say amen, don't worry. We're going to keep coming back to this one. Uh, Mark is not giving up on this one. You're going to hear it again, right? You're going to get tired of this, All right? Now, I'm going to do something a little different in my preaching today. Uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to skip down to verses 38 through 41. Uh, there are things going on in those verses that are relevant to us as a church, uh, but I want to save 33 through 37 for my last point. So why don't we skip down to verse 38? And I'm going to have Abraham read again, and I'm going to drink some tea. Uh, verse 38, John said to him, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of, of power in my name will be, a, will be able to soon afterwards speak to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will, will by no, no means lose the reward. Thank you, Abraham. So the disciples see someone who is not one of them, not one of the 12, not part of Jesus, you know, like in a group casting out a demon by the name, uh, in the name of Jesus. And, and John says, look, we try to stop him because he's not following us. I, and I find it interesting that John doesn't say we try to stop him because he's not following you, right? Like, actually, Jesus is the master. <laughs> the 12 follow him. But John is like, this guy doesn't follow us. He's not one of us. John misses the fact that this guy actually believes that Jesus has the authority to cast out demons. He's so focused on, like, this inward, you know, like, it's, it's us versus them, um, and, and John thinks that in order to be legit, people need to be in this inner circle, right? He has that insider outside mentality. And, and those who are, are, who, are, who are part of our group have like that special status, right? And Jesus responds by saying, look, he was able to cast out the demon in my name. So he can't possibly be against us. In other words, uh, this guy is not the enemy, John. I, uh, he, he's not on the outside. He, de he decided actually to be on the side of Jesus. He was able to cast out the demon. There's something about this guy that is legit that John and maybe even the rest of the disciples are just missing. Uh, I'd just like to remind us that there's a story in the book of Acts chapters, uh, chapter 19, verses 11 through 20, where, where there's the seven sons of Sceva. I don't know if you guys remember uh, this story. The seven sons of Sceva, the high priest, are trying to cast out a demon in the name of Jesus. Right? And they tell the demon, uh, I adjure you by, the, by, by Jesus, whom Paul proclaims. Um, and the evil spirit says to them, look, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Right? And Luke tells us that the man with the evil spirit left on them, uh, mastered them, and overpowered them to the point where they fled out of the house naked. In other words, the, the, this man with the evil spirit... Uh, could identify that these guys had no authority, didn't know Jesus, didn't have a relationship with Jesus, and just basically stomped on them. Why? Well, in the ancient world, you know, some people try to cast out a demon uh, out of people by invoking the name sometimes of like a stronger power, either a, a greater demon or God or something. Uh, they thought that if you knew like the right words, right, like the right spell, the right incantation, you could overpower the demon and, and cast it out. Johnny, we're looking at your screen. If you could stop sharing, that'd be great. Um, so the sons of Sceva had heard that Paul was able to cast out a demon by the name of Jesus. And now they're going 
around trying to, you know, basically use this formula. Um, but they didn't know Jesus, right? They had, they had no authority. They had no relationship. And the demon beats him down as a result. But this guy in Mark 9 is different, right? He's not just using the name of Jesus like pixie dust. It's not just like an incantation that, that, that he's going after. He knows that there's authority in the name. But he's not one of the 12. Right? It's not about that special status that John thinks the 12 have because they're close to Jesus. Don't get me wrong. Jesus chose them. Um, you know, they were sent. You know, they're, they're disciples. Um, the kingdom of God was at work in this guy, and they missed it because he wasn't one of us. He wasn't following us. So what do I want to say about that? <clears throat> ROL, it's not about us. It's not about us. Right? It's about the kingdom of God. It's about whether or not people are becoming disciples of Jesus and being transformed by him. And we need to be the type of church that is able to see the kingdom of God at work in our community through other churches also, not just ours. It's not about us. Right? Like becoming a cliquish church that has that us versus them mentality. Man, that's easy to do. Let me tell you. Uh, the vast majority of us, just as a reminder... We're at Trinity Church before the pandemic. <clears throat> and we felt called by the Lord to not follow the vision to go into Roland Heights, right? And, and like we've been saying for, for the last few months, actually for the last year, God did not abandon us, right? Like, like God has led us. God has blessed us. God gave Steve a vision and he gave us a different vision. But, but I pray that we would never be the type of community, right? The type of church that says, oh, you're not one of us or, or like you're not like us. Right? Our temptation, because of what happened, will be to have that us versus them mentality. I want to just warn us against that. That's not, that's not of the kingdom. That's not of God. Right? And, and, and I just want to say that. Like, I, it's, um, I understand that some of you may still be angry and, and, and maybe be bitter, man, and, and sad. And like, I think we need to continue dealing with that. We, we, we can never, however, let it be about like, us versus them. Right? Like, at some point, you need to... like. Take that to the Lord. And if you're still struggling with this, everything that happened at our old church, please, please, please um, speak to one of the leadership, uh, one of the people, the leadership team, uh, and get prayer for that. You know, it's not about us versus them. Okay. God is at work here and God is at work there. God is using churches in the entire city to establish and advance his kingdom in this place. Now, we might share a different vision. We might share different theology sometimes, different expressions of faith. I just want to say that's okay, right? If they're for Jesus, they're for us and we're for them, right? Like we, we don't need to be haters about the situation. And, and you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Like some, sometimes I think what, what bothers me is, you know, I, I'll be honest with you guys. I, I don't like it when, when people start saying things about other churches. Yeah, you know, but they, but they don't worship like we do, you know, like that they don't meet at the, at, at the time that I like, you know, they don't, they don't believe, you know, we can pick a bunch of stuff about what we, what we don't like about, you know, other congregations. You know, I, I, I run into the situation a lot, especially with Latino students who either come from a Pentecostal background in LA or a Catholic background, right? Like usually that, that's, that's the two extremes in the Latino community. And, you know, students will tell me, well, you know, I don't like the Pentecostals because they believe dot, dot, dot. I don't like the Catholics because, you know, they believe this, you know, and that. And, and my response is like, why is that necessary? Right, like, why is it necessary to say what you don't like about a different church? How, how does that help you accomplish the mission that the Lord has called us to do? Right, I don't concern myself with, with things that are happening in that other church um, because God has actually called me to this church. Right, and, and talking trash about that way of doing it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't help us. Right, at the very least, that's a waste of intellectual and emotional energy. And at the extreme, at the worst, um, that type of talking builds a barrier, a wall of hostility between us and them in our hearts. I don't think God wants that. I don't think God wants that. That's not what we're called to. If they are for Jesus, don't worry about them. Let them worry about their own theology and their own expression of faith. Don't knock it, yo. You know, uh, you'd be surprised actually how much you can learn from other people who don't worship like you. You know, but we will never learn, and we're never going to partner together in the city if we have that type of mentality. So let, let, let's, let's just commit to being different, River of Life, right? Let, let us be about the kingdom of God, uh, not the kingdom of our church. And now, 
Do I want to go? Yeah, I, I struggled with this. I think as a young staff worker with university, you know, I work for university. For those of you who don't know, that's a college group. Um, and then th there's another college group, Campus Crusade for Christ, right? Like, bro. And in my early years on staff, I was like, university, man. You know, I was like, acting like a gangster, actually. You know, like gangsters, like claim their own hood. Yeah, it, it's all about, you know, the kingdom of university. Like, forget crew. Like, we're better. And you know what, man? Like, I'm 20 years in. You know, and right now, currently, in a varsity and crew, we have this partnership, a partnership together to reach all the unreached campuses, campuses that don't have a Christian ministry, right? And then there's this guy that has my job, but in crew, Gilbert Kingsley. Gilbert and I talk about, about all, the, uh, talk all the time. And now if somebody comes and they need help and I can't offer that help, boom, call Gilbert Kingsley and the Coaching Center for Crew. Why? Because me, it's not about the kingdom of varsity anymore. Right? It's about the kingdom of God. And I love that brother. I respect that brother. At some point, we need to get there, y'all. You know, it's not about the kingdom of river of life. It's about the kingdom of God. Amen? Woo! All right. Uh, Abraham, take us through 33 to 37, and I'm going to drink more tea because I'm losing my voice. Verse 33. Then they came to Capernaum, and when, they, and when he was in the house, he asked him, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they argued um, with one another who was the greatest. And he sat down, called the twelves, and said to them, Whoever wants to be the first must be last, last of all, and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them. And, talking and, and take, taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes not welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. So Jesus and the disciples get to Capernaum. They're most likely back at Simon and Andrew's house. And Jesus asked them, so what were you all talking about on the way here? And they're silent. I don't know if you all noticed that. Like, what were you all talking on the way here? And he gets crickets. All right, crickets. Um, you ever had one of those moments, you know, when when something crazy is going on or something inappropriate? I, I get this with my kids all the time. Right, I, I catch them doing something they shouldn't be doing. Santi, Mina, what are you up to? Island. You know, they, they give me the 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 cricket tre treatment, and they know that something is up. And 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 Mark says it that, uh, but they were silent for on the way, they had argued with one another. Who was the greatest? <laughs> and, and I don't know if this part of the text is just meant to be funny, but it sounds funny to me, right? Because Jesus has been talking about getting handed over to the authorities, about suffering, about being killed. Um, and these guys are talking about who's the greatest, right? Like these, these guys are in a completely different place. You know, it's like they haven't been, been paying attention. Um, and in the Greek, this word that's being used, it, it's, it's where we get the word dialogue, right? Like that, that word argue in the Greek, it's not like they're, they're angry, like, you know, they're not angry arguing. They're actually dialoguing and not just, not just talking, but like generally going back and forth, considering, pondering, reasoning with each other, actually building up a case like a lawyer would um, about who is the greatest, right? They want to know who is the greatest, and it throws me off. For a minute because um there are discussions about this all the time i ask you all who is the greatest right like who is the greatest uh, greatest of all time and when i think about the greatest of all time i think about a goat right but johnny give me the next slide you know um all right so that's a goat greatest of all time for those for those of you who don't know um you know and, and, and when, like let's say sports analysts hey, on espn argue about who the goat is they're talking about points scored. They're talking about like assists, the number of championships won, how many MVP awards a player ha has. So like I laugh, right? Like in like my mind, when I think about the greatest of all time, I'm thinking about a goat. And maybe that's why, why it's funny. Yeah, thank you, Molly. Uh, greatest of all time, goat. Um, so are the disciples arguing about which one of them casted out more demons? You know, or like who fed more people um, uh, in the feeding of the 5,000? Or like who, who, has, who has healed more people? Right, like, hey, Peter, how many healings do you have, you know? Uh, have, have you been counting? Or like, oh, what, do you only have, you only healed two lepers? You know what, whatever, man, like, I healed four. 
No, like that, that's not what that argument is about, okay? The word greatest in Greek is megas, megas. Um, to be used to describe large objects. We have that word in English also, right? It, it's meant to, to, to talk about things that are big in size, mega size, um, but here it's being used in a different way. Uh, mega also means being relatively superior in importance to somebody else. And you, and you see what the disciples are arguing about is which one of them has the most value, right? Which one of them is the most important in the bunch. And this, my friends, is sad. Right? Like, like these guys are comparing themselves at a deeper level. Which one of us has the most worth? And it obviously bothers Jesus, right? Because he sits them down to teach this time. Almost like, y'all are not getting something, man. Like, I, I got to sit you all down. And, and what he's about to tell them is important enough to demand their whole attention. And he tells them, whoever wants to be the first must be the last of all and the servant of all. What does that mean? Don't, yeah, don't skip ahead yet, Johnny. What does that mean? Like whichever of you wants to be the most important or valuable, you must become the last, the one who has the least rank, the least value. And you must be, be willing not only to have the least value, but be, to, to be the servant of everybody. Servant here is the word uh, diakonos. It refers to somebody who waits on tables, somebody who, who, who assists other people. So river of life, listen up, in the, in, in the kingdom of God, right? If you want to be the greatest, the person of the most importance, you have to be willing to become the least important in the group and serve the rest of the community. Now, that's counterintuitive to everything that we've been taught since we were kids, right? All of us, since the time we were born, we've been programmed, right, to believe that the greatest amongst, uh, amongst us are those who have the most money, people who are the smartest, people who are the most beautiful, the most skilled, the, one, the people with the biggest house, the biggest paying job, uh, the, the most important job, the one that, that scores the most points, right, the, the person who is the fastest but in the kingdom of God, those things don't make you great. That, those things are not more important, right? In the kingdom of God, in God's family, the, the way that Jesus is teaching his disciples to be, it is those who are at the bottom, those who wait on table, who give themselves up for the benefit of all, for the benefit of the community, who are the greatest in his eyes. Now, I mentioned to you a few weeks ago that chapter eight begins this contrast between divine thinking and human thinking. Do you remember that? Right? That, that Jesus tells Peter that the Messiah must suffer. Peter doesn't like it, rebukes Jesus. So uh, Jesus rebukes him back and puts Peter in his place. Get behind me, Satan. And as I mentioned, Jesus was, was reminding Peter about his role as a disciple. A disciple follows his master. Get behind me, Peter. And the passage begins, I was arguing, that contrast between God's way, which leads to suffering and to the cross, and, and calls us to take up our cross as well, and human thinking that always entices us to not take up our cross as disciples, and like I was arguing early, earlier, to take the easy way out. And that contrast continues here. Human thinking tells you that the greatest are the ones on top, right? But divine thinking, the way of God, the way of the kingdom, teaches you that it is those who are at the bottom who have the most value. And to prove the point, Jesus takes a child in his arms and he says, whoever welcomes one, one um, such child as this in my name welcomes me and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Children in this culture represented the least significant group. It's not that they're not loved, okay? I want you to hear that. Children are loved. It's just that they don't have all the rights, you know, that adults would have. That they, you know, they, they have to do whatever their, their parents tell them to do. Right? We, we, uh, they weren't considered the same as adults. And it's, and it's true in some of our cultures too, right? Like for me, growing up Latino, I, I, didn't, um, I wasn't allowed to be at the grown-up table at holidays until I was like 22 or 23 years old. You know? So notice, I didn't have the same status as, as my, my aunts and uncles or anybody else, uh, really until like I married Molly and then I became a real adult. You know what I mean? Um, now, some of you are, are, are hearing that. I'm like, yo, that's horrible. And I'm like, well, that's just kind of how we grew up. It's not that our parents didn't love us. It's just they didn't, 
you know, um, respect us in the same way, you know, or like our, our words didn't value as much, you know. So I think what, what Jesus is, is trying to get at is that uh, in the kingdom of God, those who are great are people who receive those who don't have influence, right? Those who don't have power, who seem unimportant in the eyes of the world, the poor, the outcast, right? Those who are hated, those who, who have no voice, right? And if we want to be great in the kingdom of God, we must be the lowest of all and the servants of all and be receptive to those who are insignificant in the eyes of the world. Like those, those are the greatest in the kingdom of God. So this is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And, and I just want you to know, man, like this was one of the hardest lessons for me to learn <laughs> about being a disciple. Uh, and let me tell you why. You all know, uh, told you the story before that I came to this country illegally. Some of y'all know my story. Uh, and then I went to UCLA. I didn't go to UCLA because I wanted to be the lowest and the servant of all. Right? Like I went to UCLA because I wanted to be the opposite. I wanted to, have, uh, to, to be at a big name school because I wanted people to think that I was the top dog, like just straight up, you know? I wanted to go to an important place so that people could think that, you know, I'm an important person. So I didn't fully understand this passage until I, I came on, on to leadership at UCLA. And, and, and I remember our first, my first leadership retreat was intense, y'all, right? Like we met before school started. Uh, I was already bitter at that because I had to give up a weekend and giving up a weekend at that point in my life meant that I was giving up a weekend where UC, the UCLA football team uh, uh, was playing. So I wasn't going to go to the game. I was just really angry. And we were meeting from Friday morning all the way through Sunday afternoon, right? And, and that weekend we prayed, you know, we looked at scripture, uh, we, we, we looked at the strengths and the weaknesses of the ministry. We made decisions about where we thought God was taking us. Uh, and to be honest you, with you, I don't remember any of the specifics. I don't remember any of it, okay? I don't remember what we prayed about. I don't remember the passages. I don't remember the plan. I don't even remember the vision for that year. But let me tell you what I do remember. I remember being very tired on Sunday evening, like annoyed tired. You guys know what I'm talking about? Have, have you ever just like hung out at the end of the day, like 9, 9.30 p.m., and you're just like annoyed tired? You know, you're just like frustrated. You feel it in your body. That's where I was. And we started cleaning the room uh, that we had been meeting uh, in for, for the last three days. We put all our, you know, uh, Bibles and books and markers away. We stored our food away in, in our bags to take home. We folded up the tables and the chairs. And I, and I remember sitting there um, thinking, man, somebody needs to vacuum the floor because uh, it's dirty up in here. We've been in here for three days. There are crumbs everywhere. And I remember telling myself that I couldn't do it because I was too tired, right? So, so I'm just sitting there. But I had the thought, right? Like somebody needs to clean the floor. And then my staff worker, Joyce Yen, who had been leading us all weekend, who had prepared for weeks to make this thing happen, walks over to the closet and starts to vacuum. And she just looked, at, huh, I'm going to start crying. That's how much it impacted me. She, she looked exhausted, man. And it dawns on me. <laughs> Joyce is just as tired as I am. More even, but she, she chose to serve me right now. And it spoke to me, man, like, like watching Joyce vacuum that room as exhausted as she was just convicted me. It taught me that all that planning, everything that we had done that weekend didn't matter anything, that it was irrelevant if I wasn't being, if, if I wasn't willing to be a servant like Joyce was a servant. And I learned more about being a disciple and a leader from watching Joyce vacuum than anything else that we did that weekend. And that, that just transformed the, the way that I approached my faith and discipleship from that point on. That, that it wasn't just about, you know, the glory and the title. You know, like I think all of us want, 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 want the greatest, you know. I'll, I'll give you another example of this. It's, it's, you know, closer to, to now. Uh, Johnny was on sabbatical. When was it? Four years ago, almost Johnny, four and a half, uh, yeah, about four years ago. And Albert and Christine asked, asked us 
uh, invited us to be the interim pastors. Um, so uh, the first Sunday that Johnny was, Johnny was gone, I went early in the morning. You know, I think it was like maybe 7.30, 8 o'clock. I forget what. I showed up there before Carlos and the rest of the worship peeps were there. I opened up the rooms. And, and Johnny had instructed me, do a walk around of the property just to see what's going on. And I get to the front of the church, and there are all these, like, broken beer bottles out on Garfield, just, like, all over the place, man. You know, and, and it was September, I think, um, maybe late September, Johnny, or something like that. And it was hot, yo. It was going to be, like, 100 degrees. So I'm out there in, like, 90-degree weather early in the morning, just sweeping glass. And the Lord reminds me of this story of Joyce vacuuming. And I hear the Lord say, you know what? Forget about the title, Abner. Interim pastor. You know, this is what I'm calling you to. Nobody saw that. You know, but I think that was for me. That, that was the Lord reminding me what it meant to be great in his kingdom. You know, that the title didn't matter. I had responsibility, sure, but it wasn't about the title. River of Life, I just want you to know that, like, um, being the servant of all, it, it's going to cost you. Right? It, it's, it's another way of, of carrying your cross. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost us money. It's going to cost us uh, dreams and desires, right? Because you're going to put other people's needs ahead of you. You know, and you're going to have to give up on, on, on some of the things that you want to do because you, you're gonna, God is going to call you to serve other people. It's going to cost you your dignity because some people are going to see that you're a servant and they're going to want to try to take advantage of you. But it's also going to speak to people. People are going to notice that you're different. My friend John lived in the dorms at UCLA. And that guy, Matt John, was a party animal before he came to Jesus. This dude was just nuts. And one day in the middle of the night, a bunch of the uh, drunk guys on the floor made a mess of, uh, of the bathroom floor. I think one of them puked all over the place, but didn't bother to clean it up, right? And, and, and the Bible study leader on the floor, Dave, walks into the bathroom, sees the mess, and he grubs, it grabs a bunch of paper towels and gets down on his hands and knees to clean up drunken throw up in the bathroom in the middle of the night so john my friend john walks in and he just trips out right he's like half drunk and, he, and he's watching this dude clean up a bunch of throw up from the floor he says dave what are you doing and dave, dave looks up oh i'm cleaning the floor um dave you don't need to clean the floor right the cleaning ladies are coming in a few hours they get paid to do that you don't need to do this dave and Dave's response is, I know, I'm cleaning the floor because Jesus would clean the floor for them. And John's like, like, Dave, why would Jesus clean the floor for them? Because Jesus is a servant, and he loves the cleaning ladies and honors them. And at that point, John gets down on his hands and knees and begins to help um, Dave clean the floor. A, a few days later, John starts showing up to Dave's Bible study, and eventually he comes to faith. That was 30 years ago, okay? My friend John Teeter is now a senior pastor at Fountain of Life Covenant Church in Long Beach. He's helped to train hundreds of evangelists and apostles. He's led hundreds of people to faith. He's discipled dozens and has a nonprofit organization that he formed in partnership with the Covenant Church that plants churches all over the world. But he came to faith because Dave, like Jesus, was willing to be the servant of all by cleaning puke off the bathroom floor so that the cleaning ladies wouldn't have to. Brothers and sisters, don't be afraid to be the least of all. So let me pause here for a minute and give us time to reflect on what we just heard. I, I, I sense a spirit moving in me as I was writing this part of the sermon, and I wanted to give us the opportunity just to pause and have the Lord speak to us. All right, so I'm just going to pause. I'm not going to say anything. Keep yourselves muted. What is God saying to you? What is God saying to you? 
if we want to be great in the kingdom of God, we must be the lowest of all and servants of all and be receptive to those who are insignificant in the eyes of the world. What is Jesus telling you? Church, I want you to know that being the least of all is not easy. It's not glamorous. It's hard. And, and before I send you into uh, breakout groups, I want to share a worship song with you that has helped me every time Jesus has called me into hard things. Uh, when Jesus calls us to do hard things, we can't turn to our own strength to make it happen. You know what I mean? Like on your own, you're not going to want to do it. So I just, I just turn to Jesus every single time and ask Jesus to give me courage to say yes to him. But it's a choice. I, every single time, um, it's a choice. And I always turn to this song. So I'm being a little bit vulnerable, okay? Um, I'm going to share the song, Johnny. Um, this is a little bit old school. But I just want you to um, just let the Lord speak to you, let the Holy Spirit to you. Here we go. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to send us um, into breakouts. And we're just going to be reflecting um, on how that, how that statement challenges us, right? If we want to be great in the kingdom of God, we must be the lowest of and servants of all and be receptive to those who are insignificant. I just want you to share what it is that the Lord was, has been telling you and doing in you. Give you... Um, Probably like 10 minutes. I don't know about you, but I, I, that, I felt very moved um, by those stories and in our breakout room and just the, the, I don't know, there's something so sacred about this because this is where Jesus is. This is what Jesus does. So these in stories, they just like, wow, I see the kingdom of God when I hear these stories. But then I also realized that like most of the time we're cleaning the you know glass bottles on the street. Nobody notices. It's not the inspiring story we get to share. It's the like this is really hot and not fun, you know, but like it honors Jesus. And there's something in that Jesus lives in those places in a unique way. Cause that's who he is. And I found like, as I enter into that, I know Jesus more deeply. I think there's a, yeah. So anyways, lots of good things to wrestle with. And I'm just praying, Jesus, would you give us each an opportunity to practice this today and tomorrow? And especially when we really don't want to do it when it's hard, when it costs us something, would you help us to choose to want to be like you and to honor you and to worship you in this way, God? Would you make us more like you? Pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Abner. And uh, we have a special treat. Um, so Christina is with us today from France. So um, maybe you can unmute yourself for just uh, like a quick second and we can just give her a little clap, clap, clap.
Yeah. Welcome. Yay! Yay! Yay. Yay. Awesome. So Christina is going to give us an update. So you guys can go ahead and uh, uh, meet yourself again. But Christina is going to give us an update from France. I think it's like in the evening there now. Um, yeah. She's going to give us an update on what God's been doing in her ministry. So thanks, Christina, for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's about nine o'clock here right now. So my bedtime soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to thank you guys all for, for your support. Um, I just recently got back from French school, so uh, it was a three-month uh, intensive straight immersion French school. It was supposed to be one month classes, two months immersion, and all in a Christian community. So it is through the same organization I work with, which is Youth with a Mission. And so... I went in knowing zero French, uh, French, and so je peux parler en français maintenant. Uh, that's uh, I can speak French now in French. Um, so <laughs> that's really exciting. It was a tough time that really challenged me, not just on the level of French, but on uh, on like God's call for my life. Like, why am I in France? Why am I learning French? Um, it was really hard because it was really immersion right away. And so literally day one, people were talking in French. And I'm like, I don't know, I have enough classes yet. I don't know what you're talking about. And so the first week almost broke me. Like I was like almost in tears. I was like so upset. I was like, God, why would you send me to French school that was not for beginners? And it was more of, I really just kept getting like, God was like, trust me, like trust the process. Like I didn't bring you here um, to, to fail. And he just kept reassuring me. Um, and just kept reminding me of the scripture, trust in the Lord with all your heart, on your own intelligence for light, not in all your ways submit to him, for he will make straight your path. And so I submitted to him and um, and I, I practiced, I, I did the classes. Um, I also added Duolingo because I wanted to, you know, make sure I was really getting the opportunity to fully grow. And so um, it was great. I met a lot of people in the French community I got a good uh, foundation in base, um, base in French that now I'm able to use in ministry purposes, which is really exciting because I've been able to go on evangelism speaking French. I've been able to go to French house churches and get to know people um, in like little small towns and, you know, work with um, families and sit and like pray together and do Bible reading music. Let me tell you, praying in another language is so hard, and I'm like so not there yet. Right now, it's like, thank you, Lord, for food. Thank you, Lord, for insert person's name. And it's very merci Dieu, merci Seigneur, um, and um, very basic, but like my heart's there, and the Lord sees that. So, uh, um, yeah, that's been really exciting. Uh, so that was school was down in Provence, and so now I am back in Paris. And I arrived back in April 1st, so I've been in this like kind of transition time of going from three months school to now back to working in the hospitality ministry, which is a ministry that I am leading here. And so that is um, the upkeep of the base, making sure that if there's events that we're planning, them welcoming the guests, making sure that there's beds available. Uh, like recently, I just made, um, um, I helped, um, get a room ready because uh, we work with a different organization that works with refugees in the city so then we were able to um ready a whole apartment so we can have this guy who stayed with us before um and so he so you know so instead of having to live on the street he'll be able to have like an apartment with a bathroom and a shower and so we get to work and partner with different organizations where we can do stuff like that so it's really cool um as for what my ministry looks like now besides the um the cleaning and making rooms and making schedules and rosters like that's like the day-to-day -day stuff but usually um evangelism happens like every Wednesday we have scheduled evangelism along with wherever the Lord calls you to go like say like on the weekend you're out and the Lord's like go talk to that person and pray for them you know walk in obedience and pray for that person um but we do have structured time where it's meant for like outward ministry that's changed because we are under confinement right now meaning that not just the borders are closed but regions are closed 
we can't travel between different regions in France. Um, except confinement's not as strict as they say it is. People don't care. And they're not very honoring to what the government has to say. So it's so it's a mixture of we're trying to honor the government, but um, also minister to the people that that are out on the street right now. And so uh, instead of like you know street performances and stuff like that, we're going to be doing prayer walks around the city, going two by two and praying for people as they come, as we meet them. And so we're going to be praying within our ministry. So I have a team about uh, about six of us right now, and so we'll be splitting up into pairs and going just like all over praying for the city for the area for um for women um oh and that's something else i wanted to mention is that i love with working with women working with women is one of my passions i just have such a heart um to help other women in need like i've had some very challenging life experiences that um that have really shaped and shifted me and really turned that god really used to mold me into the to the woman that i am now and so I want to use my experience, strength, and hope to go share that with women and in the form of doing a beauty ministry. And so for evangelism, uh, when there was no confinement, I would invite women into our, our like home base and, you know, invite them to tea, let me give you a manicure, let me get to know you. And so something that the Lord really spoke to me over French school was that I want to look to, not just to learn French, to minister to the people, um, but to actually go to school eventually to um, get a senior certification so I can actually start a ministry like um, that would be okay under French law. And so I needed this, um, this the French language in order to go to school in France and all that. So that's one of the things that I'm going to be working towards in the next few years is becoming fluent to the point where I can take a test, write, you know, do do examinations, write essays, do all of that all in French. So then that way I can really, really um, plant roots into the city, speak into women's lives that are not easily accessible, that men can't reach these women, um, you know, and really build a connection with them. And there's like a really big Muslim population in this area. There's a lot of refugees in the area that I'm working with, uh, not working with, but in living with. And so I'm really excited to start making more and more connections. Um, I already have a friend, you know, she's an Algerian refugee and she's like super sweet. I've been able to give her a Bible um, and, you know, she wants to do readings with me in English. And so like, there's just the opportunity is there and we're just kind of waiting for like COVID to kind of die down so we can start building those interactions more and more. So just in the meantime, we're doing a lot of focus on prayer. So prayer walks and we've just seen prayer move so much in this area. We've seen major shifts in this area um, in terms of like how the city's improving because we live in like I guess what you can call the ghetto of the city. Like if you go into Paris, like city center, and you say, oh, I'm from Obrivier, they're like, that's, that's like, don't, don't even talk to me about that city. Like, you know, like it's just a rough neighborhood. Like, but I, we just choose not to walk in fear and to really embrace the area that we serve in. And so, so that's, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I'm like talking way too much. I get so excited when I talk about like ministry and where I serve and who I'm serving with. But if you would love to know more, I'll put my email in there and we can email. Uh, I'm a little late on my last email update. Sorry, transition kind of threw me off a little bit, but I'll be sending one out soon. And if you want to know more information about any of the things that I've talked about, like I'm more than happy to talk about it. Just, yeah, to anybody. That's awesome. Thanks, mm -hmm. Christina. Super uh, encouraging to hear. And I think just connecting it to the sermon today, just that picture of like learning a language is kind of putting yourself low, right? It's that going to that place of humility of like, I don't know, it's like starting all over again, feeling, and then being in hospitality ministry, you know, again, yeah. it's like you're, you're choosing to serve so that other people can come and stay and experience what God's doing, you know, um, um, and even thinking about where you live and, and some of these women and refugees, right? Like, I just think mm -hmm. there's that picture of like, okay, Jesus, I want to be like you. And I want to walk the road that, that you're walking. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, I, and I just love it that the other word that came to my mind when you were talking is like foundation, Jesus building foundations in you, like in mm -hmm. language, in the sense of your passions with women and your own story connecting. So there's just something that God's building foundation for this larger thing that he's going to do in you and through you. So mm -hmm. that's awesome. We're proud uh, to support you. So if you don't know this church, but we, we actually started, so as we started getting our budget, we passed that. So we started supporting Christina officially as a minist uh, missionary in our church. So um, yeah, we're excited to do that. But then there's also those of us that are uh, just wanting to come around Christina that are supporting her individually. So if you would want to think about supporting her individually, you could do something like $25 a month or $50 a month or a one-time gift. Those are those are all things that are basic are ways that we can serve so that God can do this work through her. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, and then you can, uh, she'll put her email there so you can connect with her. And also on our website, there is a, a place that's related to missions and a blog there that you can be reading things about updates. And she'll be coming periodically every couple months just to give us mm -hmm. an update, so. Yeah, so we're proud of you, Christina. Let me pray for you. Thank you so much. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, Jesus. I just thank you so much for Christina and um, mm -hmm. yeah, how she's really living out that picture of, of your cross and mm -hmm. wanting to, to, yeah, she's paid a lot of costs to be in France, mm -hmm. to go to a whole nother culture, to leave her family, um, to learn another language uh, and, and, and understand another heart language of another people group. Um, yeah, that is, that is putting herself low. It's, it's, it's cost a lot. Um, but Jesus, we thank you, um, that you are with her in that. And I pray that she would know you deeply, that she would grow. God, would you continue to put your heart in her heart for the French people, particularly even for the people in that neighborhood that she's around, um, that are often forgotten or despised. Um, and so I just pray that her heart would grow to have more of your heart, that she, in the going low um, and following you into the, these places, Lord, that she would know you more deeply um, as she's walking the path that you're walking, God. So I just pray for your blessing over her and her French development, God, as, as she gets French, it's like access to people's hearts and, um, and uh, just that, I don't know, the path being made straight. So would you continue to be with her and her language learning? um god continue to be with her and her, her everyday things related to hospitality mm -hmm. ministry and help her do that as she's doing it unto you and mm -hmm. jesus i also just pray god for your favor over her as she's doing evangelism mm -hmm. as she's interacting with refugees as, as they're praying god would you just be sowing into her the deep things and and for to her team the deep things that um as COVID opens there's just mm -hmm. more opportunity to to give out from that place, Lord. Um, so we just pray your blessing over her and your protection over her in Jesus' name. God, I thank you that, um, yeah, she's choosing to have courage um, and not be afraid. And so I just pray for your protection, your covering over her, that you continue to fill her with your spirit, Lord God. And would you prov provide for her financially also, God, I pray as a church, um, just as we did in World Vision, God, would we be able to come around Christina and really say, um, she belongs to me and I belong to her. And, and just that feeling of like what you're doing in France is connected to us as a church as we come around her. So God, would you be moving our hearts to be able to join her in her mission, Lord? So we thank you, Jesus, for all these things. Um, and we pray it in your name. Amen. 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 Thank, thank you, so Christina. Much. Woo, we love you, girl. Thank you. Love you. Okay. If you want to um, connect with Christina, make sure you go ahead and get her email so you can do that. I'm going to turn over to Jesse so he can close us out for the announcement. Uh, yeah, Amna, can you pray, uh, share the slides? Thank you. So we are continuing our weekly life groups this week. Um, continuing in our passage in chapter nine. And then I'm going to have uh, Tammy, the co-captain for Team ROL, give the next announcement. Yeah, so um, we are officially done, but you can still donate if you want to. Um, I haven't given us an end date, um, but I know that right now we're at 35,000, um, 800, something like that. Um, and then also I wanted to let the team know that to expect an email from Johnny and myself, um, because May 15th is when we're gonna plan our celebration picnic. And if you wanna be involved in those details, you can let us know 
Um, we chose May 15th, so hopefully that'll be a time where um, more people are vaccinated fully and uh, we can gather together um, and have a meal and just celebrate um, what God has done through our team this uh, season. So hope to see you guys there. Okay. All right. So I know we were asking about um, praying for praying for just as things open up, like just how are we are going to be gathering um, as, a, as a church and um, especially as things are opening up with in-person. And so one of the things that has happened this, uh, that actually happened this week was we got heard back from the city that um, the service club that is right next to where we had our Easter service in person um, by the picnic shelter is actually opening up because the previous church that I was renting before the pandemic has told the city they're not going to continue. Uh, so this is this was <laughs> this is something we were actually praying about. It was like we really wanted something that was, you know, central to the city. There's another smaller room that we can actually use for for any of the smaller groups or for for the kids ministry. Um, so yeah, just pray, pray as we're, we're seeing kind of movement, the, the board and um, also agreed uh, this past week. And so we're hoping that this will be a, an opportunity that we can solidify uh, once things um, actually open up further. So just continue to pray for us as a leadership team. Uh, and then um, just want to again acknowledge uh, everyone who's been uh, giving uh, again on the website you'll see all the different ways that you can give uh, online right now or if you want to send a check I've been getting those as well and depositing those so thank you all for those who are um, who are giving and faithfully giving um, and then finally we have our usual uh, communal devotions at 6 30 Monday through Friday our pre-service prayer on 7 30 uh, to 8 30 on Sundays and if you want to have, um, if you need some prayer after service, uh, that will be happening as well. So, okay. All right. So as we finish up, um, let's unmute ourselves and say goodbye to everybody. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good Bye. seeing everyone. Everybody's holding up their children and pets. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I love it. It's so fun. So bye, Christina. Bye, Christina.